So this is going to be a talk by Kurt Opsahl, who's an attorney with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And uh, yeah, the talk is called Through a Prism Darkly. Give him a warm round of applause, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for coming out here. It's great to see so many people. Um, I am Kurt Opsahl. I'm an attorney with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. We are a nonprofit uh, civil liberties organization dedicated to defending your rights online. Uh, and I have been involved in litigation against the uh, NSA spying program uh, since 2006. Um, thank you. We've had that. Uh, and we've learned a lot o over that time, some of it actually first coming out in, in 2005, a lot of it coming out this summer. Uh, and so we'll talk a little bit about what we know. Uh, start out with the background, uh, where, the, where the program originated, some of the uh, code names, some of the spying laws that uh, purported to enable uh, the programs. We're going to talk about basically two types of programs, some which are purportedly authorized by law from the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act Amendment Act, or FISA, and the Patriot Act. Uh, and then some which are not uh, authorized by law but are done by executive order, which is just an order from the president to go do it. Uh, and there's a particular executive order which is dealing with collecting intelligence uh, around the world on people like you. Uh, and then finally, we'll talk about fighting back, what we can do to stop the spying. So the background, after 9-11, President Bush unleashed the full power of the NSA, unleashed the eye of Sauron to look around the world and try and find everybody all the time. Uh, the NSA had been operating under some constraints at that point. Uh, some of those constraints actually were from the original Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act of 1978, which came about after a number of scandals uh, encouraged Congress to rein in the NSA. Uh, and they went ahead beyond FISA, ignoring FISA, with what was called the President's Surveillance Program. Uh, a subset of that program was later called the Terrorist Surveillance Program, and that first was admitted by the President uh, in 2005. Uh, the TSP was actually a tautology. It was that portion of the larger program that surveilled terrorists. And so it enabled them to say things like the TSP only surveils terrorists because by definition any part of it that didn't surveil a terrorist wasn't part of the TSP. The uh, PSP was done without any court warrants, uh, without any of the legal authorities and niceties that generally happen in a you know, rule of law uh, type of government. So, why did they do it, or how did they do it? Well, the main inspiration came from uh, the fortuitousness of having U.S. companies sitting on top of the wire. Uh, this uh, comes from one of the original uh, PRISM slides that came out uh, back in June, and it shows the paths of communications between various regions in the world and the amount of bandwidth. And as you can see, the very large, wide orange lines are focused on U.S. and Canada. And what this means is that a lot of communications around the world, even if they're not going to and from the United States, uh, even if they are going between two other regions, will likely pass through the United States because that is the cheapest path. That is the one that is going to be the more efficient path. Uh, and that allows the companies who are sitting on the wire to look at what's going past. So they started doing this program, and they were doing it for a number of years uh, in super secrecy, so secret, in fact, that the, uh, the legal department, the general counsel of the NSA, was not allowed to see the legal reasoning behind it. Uh, very few people within the U.S. Department of Justice were allowed to see the legal reasoning behind it. But eventually that broke down, and some of the people in the DOJ started to see the memos that, that uh, explained why they thought this was legal. And there was actually a very interesting incident in 2004 uh, where the acting attorney general got a hold of the reasoning and there was one aspect of it that he just couldn't buy. Uh, and that was, uh, and you know, just sort of, this is not a you know, civil libertarian, this is a law and order, you know, uh, uh, conservative, really ready to surveil kind of guy, but it was still too much. And it was that they had come up with a definition of acquire such that the process by which uh, uh, previously they didn't have it and then later they did have it was not an acquisition. 
and this allowed them to get the stuff without acquiring it and thus not have to worry about those laws that talked about what you had to do to acquire things. Uh, so he didn't buy it and he refused to sign off on the president's surveillance program. Uh, so at that time, the uh, White House counsel, Alberto Gonzalez, uh, went, so I, well, I'll go over his head. He was the acting attorney general because the actual attorney general was in a hospital with pancreatic uh, cancer and, uh, or sorry, pancreatitis. And so they raced to the hospital, and this was actually uh, done with, you know, sirens and lights blowing through red lights to get there first. So uh, Gonzalez was trying to get the uh, sick attorney general to sign off it, and Comey was trying to get there to prevent that from happening. Comey did get there first. Uh, the attorney general did not sign off on it, and they threatened to resign if the program continued with this particular aspect. Uh, eventually, the program actually stopped. Uh, going under that theory, and there was a gap for a couple of months until they developed uh, a new theory uh, of being able to obtain the same information. Uh, and we never found out about it because people did not resign. However, about a year later, uh, the New York Times first revealed the existence of the PSP, and they focused on content collection, collection of content of internet communications and telephone calls. Uh, and this caused a lot of uh, fuss at the time. This is when the president came out and said, well, there is a terrorist surveillance program, but don't worry, it only surveils terrorists. Which we're already discussing what that really meant. Uh, and then in 2006, USA Today revealed the call detail records program. That's the records of who you call, how long you spoke, when the call was. Uh, and they named several companies that were participating in it, AT&T and Verizon. Uh, this is when, uh, actually, uh, in that time period, before the USA Today article, but after the New York Times, is when EFF first filed suit uh, against the program. In 2007, uh, they decided that they were going to say, okay, we'll put it under the FISA court. That's the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. It is a secret court. We'll talk about that more in a moment. And then to try to bulk up some of the legal problems, they passed the Protect America Act. This is part of sort of the American tradition of having these sort of vaguely Orwellian names. Uh, and that was a one-year uh, extension. And then finally, in 2008, they passed FISA, and that added some additional authorities, most prominently Section 702, which we'll, which we'll talk about. So as we go on, a couple of code names to sort of keep in mind. The original program, the President's Surveillance Program, was known as Stellar Wind. Uh, and you can think of it as having four parts, and I've made a little grid here. So like, on one hand, you have either telephony or internet, and then they divide it into content and metadata. And then within the grid, you can see some of the uh, databases and applications that that information goes into. Now, this does not mean that that's the only thing inside these databases. So Marina you know, takes in information from other sources as well. But this is where those things go into. Uh, a couple other code names to point out. There's one which is Evil Olive. This is for uh, geolocation. One EF is one and foreign. Uh, so in order to uh, help uh, justify their program, they try and focus on one and foreign, or at least one and foreign. They use Evil Olive to do that. I like Evil Olive because it has uh, some neat characteristics. It's a palindrome. Uh, it is also an anagram for I love evil. So I think there are some people there who have, a, have a, a sense of humor. And then FASIA, this is the location database of where you are. Uh, and the FASIA seems to be a reference to, uh, well, it, it came to too many words of fascism, I think, to be really fair. So Boundless Indeed, Boundless Informant was one of the programs or one of the databases that was revealed. This is a color map showing uh, a heat map showing where the SIG addresses are uh, getting information for. SIG addresses is a collection point. Uh, there are 504 SIG addresses which are uh, being reflected here, and this adds up to billions of pieces of information, and this is actually only showing it for a very short period of time. Now, you might, you know, as you might imagine, some places like Iran uh, is, is in red, Pakistan in red, but as you can see, there is a lot of 
countries which are uh, considered to be U.S. Uh, allies that are uh, getting more than just a little bit. You can see Germany there in orange, so, so too with the United States, the same color as China. Um, so here are some spying laws. Uh, there's the Wiretap Act. That was uh, one of the, the, the first laws that the, uh, we have in the United States to regulate when the government can listen in on your phone calls. That passed in the 60s, um, and it was largely for law enforcement. In the 70s, there was the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act that was born from some of the scandals that were, were discovered in the early 70s. In the 80s came the Electronic Communications Privacy Act that was trying to modernize communication law to deal with email communications. Um, the USA Patriot Act passed in the wake of 9-11. Of in particular, that had a Section 215, which turned out to be very important to their spying program. When that was passing, uh, that was uh, uh, referred to as the library records provision. People were thinking that this was a provision that might allow them to get records of what you checked out of libraries. Little did we know that it actually was far, far worse. Uh, the Protect America Act, this was a temporary measure. The FISA Amendment Act brought in another section, Section 702, which we'll talk about, which is the rules about spying on uh, non-Americans. And then also uh, Executive Order 12333. Uh, that was an executive order actually signed a long time ago by President Reagan. It's been updated a few times since, but it provides the framework for uh, spying outside of the legal frameworks passed by Congress. So where we first found out about this came from uh, finding out about a splitter that was in room 641A of AT&T's San Francisco facility. Uh, whistleblower Mark Klein came to EFF with some documents showing how the splitter was hooked up where uh, uh, one copy of the light stream would go to the NSA and the other copy would go to its destination and he even provided a photo of the room. You can see the room is, uh, the door has no handles. It was controlled access. You had to be approved by the NSA to get access to the room. Uh, even to the point when there was a leak uh, and it was actually causing some uh, damage to the rest of the facility, they couldn't get someone to go in there and fix the leak until they had gotten clearance and it took several, uh, several days to do so. This graphic explains how it works in uh, sort of simple form. You have all the nice people at the top. Uh, their communications go to the AT&T facilities. The splitter takes the light beam, makes two equal copies, one of which goes to 641A and the rest goes on. So how much are they able to get by sitting on the wires and putting in the splitters? Well, the NSA says, you know, it's not that much. It's only about 1.6% of the world's internet traffic. Uh, but it's worth pointing out that that, uh, that actually turns out to be a lot of information. Well, first of all, only about 12% of the traffic is, is web, another 3% communications, almost everything is video streaming. Uh, and about two-thirds of those communications is spam. So you can sort of bet that the NSA actually has some of the best spam filter technology in the world. Uh, and even if we take them at their word and say it's only 1.6%, that's th still 30 petabytes a day that they're ingesting. And that is just of the internet traffic flow. And as we know, they're also getting phone calls, call records, and location. So where do you put all of that data? Well, that turned out to be a problem. Uh, and so they built this new facility out in Utah. This is uh, just broke ground uh, the, the summer. They, they finished it up in September. Um, it is a, uh, about a 10,000 square meter server space. Various estimates have been given about the size of it. Could be up to 12 exabytes. Uses a lot of power. Um, and so Brewster Kale, you guys familiar with the uh, Internet Archive? The Wayback Machine, anyone? All right, it's good service. They store uh, a lot of data. And uh, Brewster knows a lot about storing masses amounts of, of data. And he estimated just for the US phone calls, uh, it would take uh, four, uh, 464 square meters to store and process that. That's a lot less than the total facility. So what is the rest of it? Well, it's all of your calls. It's all of the internet data. 
And what do you do with all that data? Well, so Ryzen and Lickbau, two New York Times reporters, explained what they could do is comb through it in a large data mining operation. Uh, John Yu, who is one of the uh, legal architects working for the Bush administration, described it as plucking out the emails and phone calls that have a high likelihood of being terrorist communications. So this is what they're trying to do. Uh, and how do they do it? Well, one of the ways they, they, they uh, do it is by playing a little bit of a word game on what they're doing, um, holding without collecting. That is to say, they were able to say to a number of congressional committees and other statements that they weren't collecting all of this information. Um, and then they later had to sort of explain what that meant. Uh, so the director of national intelligence, he said, think of it like a huge library. To me, collection would mean taking the books off the shelf. Now, I don't think that's how most people would think of a collection. Like if you went into a, a, a library and you said, you know, wow, what a, what a nice collection it is, you can sort of imagine that Clapper would have to say, no, it, it, it's not. Uh, I haven't read all these books yet. When asked about uh, how many uh, Americans' data were in there, the director of National Intelligence, McConnell, said, we can't know. Uh, we can't know until we look at what's in there, and so it sort of if we don't look at it, it doesn't matter. Instead, they all sort of focus on what they are targeting. And so these are so, this is a slide that is giving some of the numbers about uh, the selectors uh, for targeting. And you look at these numbers, and you know, they're fairly substantial numbers, 15,000, 19,000, uh, but not supremely huge numbers. And that is because what they're talking about is targeting, but when they are targeting something, they're hitting a lot more than their target. And so they try to minimize the amount of uh, the, the scariness of it by talking about the selectors, but when a, one selector can mean a lot of information. So let's talk about FISA 702, FISA. This is the, the section of the law that passed in 2008 that uh, is set up to design, designed for getting the content of communications uh, outside of the US. And they have two sources, you should use both. Uh, upstream, and that's sitting on the wire, the fiber optic splitters we talked about earlier. And then PRISM, which was revealed uh, this summer, and that is collection from the service providers. Um, and PRISM in involved collection both through 702 orders and also through, uh, through other means that were, were gathered in there. We will talk about those in a, in a bit. Uh, and it had some uh, targeting and minimization rules. So one is that, that the, the statute said, you know, you have to be targeting uh, foreigners. Uh, and so they interpret this to mean as a 51% chance or more that something is foreign. And so if it's slightly better than a coin flip, uh, then they assume it's foreign. And unless it's proven otherwise, so if it's unknown, if they can't figure it out one way or the other, then it's foreign. And then uh, if, if they can't tell exactly what it is because it's encrypted, well, they'll just keep it around forever until they do. And to get these orders, they go to the FISA court. Now, the FISA court, uh, I have not seen it, but uh, someone who has uh, was helpful enough to draw, make this drawing of its entrance. Uh, this is the secure door. You can see the hand reader there. You pass the code. The court meets inside a Faraday cage. It is uh, highly protected. It, right now, it is in the, uh, the court in uh, Washington, D.C. For a long time, actually, for the first like 20 years or so, it was inside the Department of Justice. So uh, in the same building as the attorneys who were going to get orders from it. Uh, then they finally sort of thought, well, that, that seems to be maybe a little bit too much to see like we're working too closely together, so we'll move it to a, to a new uh, building. It was established under the FISA Act, and in its original idea, it was about spying on spies. So, uh, you know, other foreign intelligence agents, maybe diplomats, uh, sort of the traditional notions of uh, foreign intelligence. 
but its uh, role was massively expanded, uh, especially after 9-11, and it is now being used to do far more, um, and it goes in there, and it is basically a rubber stamp court. They go in there, they provide the application, uh, they have a phenomenal approval rate, it is an ex parte court. What that means is only one side gets to argue. They only get to see what the government has to say without any counter argument. And they tend to just believe what it says. Now, after some of the uh, revelations this summer, the FISA court felt that it was necessary to sort of explain itself. Uh, and in doing so, they said basically the court does not have the capacity to investigate issues of noncompliance. They don't know what, what is doing they're basically unable to provide oversight. Nevertheless, the government often points to this court as saying this is where we get the oversight. Now, there's a couple of definitions within the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act that, that are important. Uh, one is the United States person. Uh, so this is what it is interested in protecting. It's not that interested in protecting you. It's interested in protecting US citizens or permanent residents, groups with substantial numbers of US persons or US corporations. And then what it's trying to get at is foreign intelligence information. Now that includes the things that you would sort of expect it to include. A you know, national security, terrorists. Uh, but it has another provision here. Things that relate to the conduct of the foreign affairs of the United States. Now as you might imagine, that is an extraordinarily broad uh, definition. Almost anything could relate to the conduct of the foreign affairs of the United States. And if you ever if you listen closely to when uh, the government is trying to explain what they're looking for and, and what they're doing, they will be using examples such as going after uh, uh, terrorists, including national security, uh, but of course also including the foreign affairs of the United States. So we talked before about how it had to be 51% or more foreign. So how do they figure that out? Well, the hair, we, we saw the X key score dashboard, and it has a handy pull down menu where it has a pre-selected reasons why someone might be 51% or more foreign. And all they have to do is select one of these, and then that has a pre-proved good reason, and then they move on. So you just go there, select the one you want, move on. It's very hard to make a mistake because all of the answers are correct. And then there is the targeting procedures. So here's an example of what they mean sort of by targeting something. This is an example uh, about Sweden. And what they targeted was everybody in Sweden who went to this particular uh, URL. So you put in the URL in one field, you put in the country code in the other, push the go button, and now you have a targeted uh, collection. One of the uh, uh, searches that was uh, revealed in the document uh, sort of shows how broadly this can be. It was looking for communications that had the word Ericsson, which I believe they were referring to the Swedish manufacturer and not just the last name, uh, and the word radio or radar. And you can sort of imagine how many communications, say, to or from somebody named Ericsson, might have the word radio in them. Uh, but rather than miss any, they're getting all of them. And this is what they mean by targeting things. Once they obtain the information, they process it. This slide is showing sort of how it goes. You can see some of the databases we mentioned earlier, Marina, Mainway, Nucleon. So it goes through these various uh, processes and then ends up in the database where it can be retrieved later. Now I want to turn to Section 215 of the Patriot Act. As I said, this was uh, originally thought of as a library provision. It was to allow them to produce tangible things. Um, and it had uh, what was thought to be a restriction on how broadly it could be used. These things had to be relevant to an authorized investigation. Uh, it was imagined to be similar to a grand jury subpoena, which is sort of the uh, typical process by which a prosecutor could get records from, uh, you know, from the phone company. You know, they get one record about one person at a time. Uh, then we saw the Verizon order. And the Verizon order showed what they meant by relevant was everything. All the calls of all the people 
all of the time, uh, all the information about them dumped on a daily basis with the order being constantly reviewed, renewed uh, every 90 days. So that sounds like a lot of information, but hey, it's just metadata. So in the defense of the program, uh, President Obama said, well, we're not listening to your calls. We're just sifting through so-called metadata, I like how he adds sort of the so-called in there to sort of make it somewhat uh, dismissive in it. They keep on uh, saying, we don't listen into the calls, it does not include the content. Uh, but let's, uh, let's examine some of these uh, explanations. Well, actually, one of them was, we're not getting the identity of the people involved. Well, that, that's nice, but it's possible that the NSA has access to phone book technology and they can cross-reference things. They also said no location information under this program. More recently, it was revealed than that, well, under a different program, well, that's, a, that's another story. Um, they said, well, it's only a few hundred selectors. Uh, but then once they have each selector, they take it three hops. And so that's everybody you call, everybody they call, everybody they call, and so on, until one, uh, one selector can be hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, depending on how frequently they call people, how many different people they call over the years and years of data that they are collecting. Um, so they had some legal basis for this, the FISA court. Uh, originally, they approved it by basically saying, yep, looks like it you know, meets the statute, go ahead. Uh, and then uh, you know, the, the program got revealed, there was a lot of public controversy, and only then did they issue an opinion that, that purported to have some, some legal analysis. Uh, they, the first opinion came out sort of discussing some of the legal issues. They said, yeah, you know, relevance doesn't actually mean anything. Uh, so it was okay, and then some people pointed out, well, gee, you know, you didn't look at uh, a Supreme Court case that had talked about uh, uh, you know, U.S. v. Jones, which is a Supreme Court case that talked about uh, how you couldn't, uh, you needed a warrant to go after people and surveil them with GPS. So then they issued another opinion trying to deal with that. This is after the fact justifications which they felt were necessary because of the public controversy, not a true analysis that began looking at it skeptically uh, from the beginning. When it came to an open court, things were a little bit different. We've now had uh, two court rulings that have looked at it in open court, uh, one good, one bad. Uh, so the first uh, opinion found that it was likely unconstitutional. Um, and then uh, earlier this week, there was another opinion that unfortunately went the other way. These are going to go up on appeal, uh, and uh, we hope that the right decision will eventually be reached. So, I'm going to take a moment to talk about why it matters. So they're saying, like, it doesn't really matter, it's just metadata, it's information about your calls, not the content itself. But actually, metadata matters a lot. And so we have some examples here on how, well, if you just know when the call is, who you're talking to, what time, uh, how long you spoke, you can get a great deal of information about the meaning of the communication. In fact, it may be easier to figure out what you're talking about than listening to the content. If you listen to the actual words people are speaking, they may uh, be you know, mumbling, there might be some static on the line, you have to sort of parse it. Um, it's kind of a pain, but with metadata, you have some hard facts and you can make inferences that can often tell you a lot more about the meaning of the communication than actually parsing the communications themselves. So the final authority under this three-part system is Executive Order 12333. So this is, it's an authority in some sense, but it is not a limit on spying. And unlike the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, uh, where it is trying to put some limitations and say there has to be the limitation and targeting and so on. Uh, it is not a substantive limit. It suggests you use the least intrusive collection techniques feasible. If, uh, you know, something extremely intrusive is the least intrusive, well, then so be it. Um, and it's okay so long as it's in accordance with procedures. 
So they can come up with procedures, and once those procedures are in our place, then they've satisfied the requirements of 12333. And then also, helpfully, at the end of 12333, they mention that if, they, if there's any violation of it, there's no substantive right. You can't sue to say that, that uh, this was unlawful because they violated Executive Order 12333. So under that authority, they do a couple things. They do some bulk operations. So we found out about some of the phone call operations, 70 million calls in France, 60 million in Spain, uh, apparently uh, with the assistance of the French and Spanish intelligence service. They're using this to get financial records through uh, SWIFT. SWIFT is the uh, cooperative owned by several, uh, several thousand financial institutions. So this is getting uh, information about your credit card transactions and what you're spending and where. Um, but that wasn't enough, so they also needed to get some of the information from the internet providers. Uh, so we recently learned about the muscular program. Uh, and this was going into the data links between tech company data centers. If you guys have been to several of the uh, uh, talks here, you've probably seen this uh, graphic quite a bit. It's a pretty good one. They uh, point out where the SSL is added and removed, add the little taunting smiley face. Um, this smiley face, I think, has come back to bite them. Uh, it has been interpreted as a bit of a taunt by the companies, and the companies have responded uh, by encrypting the links between their data center, increasing the adoption of HTTPS by default, uh, by using strict transport security, adding forward secrecy. Uh, we recently did a survey, our Crypt the Web report, that's shown there. Uh, on the slide, you can, the green check marks are for the companies who are doing uh, some of these things. Uh, the, the, the column on the, uh, on the left is for encrypting data center links. There's a lot more check marks there than even when we started the survey. Though there are some notable uh, exceptions on there, uh, you'll notice that all of the uh, uh, telecom providers, uh, well, they have a lot of um, black, uh, red marks and unknowns. I don't think that they're going to be pushing too hard for additional encryption. We learned about the co-traveler program. This is the program by which they obtain location information from a wide variety of uh, sources. Um, and they automate guilt by association. So if people are traveling together, hanging out together, and they don't like one of them, then they now don't like the other one. Uh, and they look at the speed and trajectory of two people's cell phone patterns and then say, oh, they're traveling together. So uh, given uh, where we all are, the cell towers around here has now added a lot of new co-travelers to their database. So sorry about that. You're, you're now part of this program. Uh, they also have started looking for disposable cell phones, which is for one of the things that many people are trying to do in order to protect themselves from surveillance. Maybe if they're a journalist, they want to talk to a source, starting using disposable cell phones. Well, uh, they're trying to make that more difficult. They're looking for phones which are being switched on. You make a call, you switch it off. And they're looking for situations in which you've been using a phone for a while, and then you stop using it, and then a new phone uh, connects. So if you are going to be switching to a new uh, cell phone, um, don't do it at the same time. Leave the old one on for a while. Uh, if you're trying to avoid being tracked on, on a phone, leave the phone somewhere instead of turning it off and on again. And then they have the targeted operations. Um, so in addition to the bulk collection, they use some of the information obtained in the bulk collection to go after specific people. Uh, we know about uh, going after uh, Chancellor Merkel's uh, cell phone since uh, before she was the chancellor, using American diplomatic buildings. They have spied on at least 35 world leaders. Uh, and it also has been revealed that this is not just for uh, counterterrorism, not just for uh, international espionage against uh, adversary uh, states, but economic spying on allies. And this comes back to the definition of foreign intelligence information, which includes anything having to do with the foreign affairs of the United States. So economic spying falls within that system. Uh, they're doing man in the middle. There's a great slide that came out from Brazilian TV, Flying Pig. 
uh, which was a, a program that was organizing some SSL certificates in order to basically get around SSL, they own the router, then uh, do the attack. Um, one thing that came out from the flying pig, I think if you compare that with Prism, it suggests someone in the code name department is a fan of Pink Floyd album covers. We've also learned a bit more in the last couple of days about the tailored access operations, the DAO of NSA. Uh, this is where they are doing particular targeted operations. We've known about some of them against the Mexican president's email, OPEC, others. Uh, one of the ways in which they are targeting is using the Google Pref cookie, the advantage being that almost Everybody who uses a browser at some point in time is going to encounter some Google ads, get a Google Pref cookie. It is theoretically anonymized, but it is unique enough to have it become a point of target. And then once they have a target, they use the quantum uh, insert. This is a, a diagram, actually this, this is one of the ones that just came out yesterday, showing how the quantum insert uh, method works. When your communication is going to a, a website, they get in the middle, they are sitting on the wire, so they're able to operate faster than the, in this case, Yahoo server, get the tainted communication uh, back to you and direct you to the Fox Acid server. The Fox Acid server is then uh, programmed to serve up the appropriate malware. Uh, the, the, actually, the code name for the program that serves the malware is called the Ferret Cannon. Uh, so the Ferret Cannon shoots the malware, which, which is appropriate for the circumstances. Uh, what they are trying to do is make sure that they don't burn too many things. So if they think that you're a sophisticated user, which they may think for many of the people in this audience, they're not going to put a sophisticated attack on there in case you find it and then it becomes uh, known to the world. Uh, depending on the value of the target, they may use something which is a zero day or they may use something which is not that important. And then bull run, this is sabotage. Uh, inserting vulnerabilities, trying to make the crypto systems upon which we all rely uh, become, well, worthless. Putting the pseudo in pseudo random. Uh, so we have learned some pretty uh, uh, compelling evidence that uh, dual EC has been horribly compromised. And not only that, that RSA was paid uh, $10 million to continue to have it be part of the standard. Um, and then apparently in 2010, using the sabotage program, they were able to break through vast amounts of data. Uh, we still don't know exactly what that is, uh, but it is, um, well, it's allowing them to look at things which seem to be encrypted on, uh, on the wires. They've also been very interested in going after Tor. Uh, the good news here is that Tor, the fundamental security appears to be intact. They are going after the Firefox bugs that are uh, with the Tor browser bundle using Firefox. Um, we actually have an example of this technique that was, was revealed in the NSA slides being used uh, on Freedom Host, which was using a JavaScript bug uh, to identify people who went to .onion routers that were being hosted on Freedom Host. Uh, when they were doing this, it was rather not discriminatory. Anybody who went to Freedom Host, whether it was one of the targeted sites which were uh, serving child porn, or if it was somebody who was using it for an opposition site, an activism site, all of them got this bug and they were used to track them back. Uh, and I think this, this is a little bit dangerous. We, we made actually, this was a, a, the graphic at the bottom is a, a modification that we made of the NSA graphic to show why this matters is that it's very hard to tell the difference between a terrorist with the Tor client installed and an activist with the Tor client installed, but it's important not to treat them the same and to realize that activists use and depend on Tor. We've also heard from the government that there hasn't been any abuse. We heard that for a while, and then an audit came out, finding that there were 2,776 incidences in one year of unauthorized collection. And this was just in the DC and Fort Meade area, which was uh, one of, uh, or two of several NSA areas. Uh, things 
they were saying, one thing, this was not abuse. So uh, somebody mistyped a country code. Instead of putting in 20 to indicate Egypt, they put in 202, which is the area code for Washington, D.C. Uh, and they got all of the, the communications in Washington. Uh, and this was deemed to be no big deal because it pertained to metadata, so there were no defects to report. So when you hear the government say things about there isn't that a mess, abuse, remember that they might be doing things where saying, well, this wasn't the category of things that rise in the level of abuse, but you might not agree with what their standards are. It also reveals something rather amazing about the program, that you could actually have something by making a typo between 20 and 202, uh, there's no further check. You put in 202, hit the, the return key, and off you go without it saying, you know, are you really sure that you want to do this? Um, this is putting tremendous power in the hands of analysts without much oversight. Uh, and then another form of abuse that came about, they, it was cute because they had even a name for it, Love Int, where there were at least 10 incidents where people were using their NSA superpowers to look after their ex-lovers and spouses and see what they were up to. And you might say, well, you know, 10 incidents, it's offensive, but uh, not, not that many. But keep in mind that these are 10 incidents of self-reported. 10 times people came and told them that they had misused their powers. Uh, this is not 10 incidents that they have found after thoroughly scoring what everybody was doing and then finding what was being done. One of the things they're also using for is discrediting radicalizers. So they look at what they call radicalizers, and they look at things like their visits to porn sites, look at their online promiscuity, try and find things that will make their voice less uh, valuable. And what they deem are radicalizers are people who speak to extremist communities. And so it's not so much that they are doing anything illegal themselves, but they are, might be inspire somebody else to take some views that the NSA doesn't like. Um, and using this to undercut their message. So, what are we doing about it? Well, one thing that we're doing is working on legislation and activism. Uh, EFF worked with the Stop Watching Us Coalition, and we got over half a million petition signatures delivered to the US co Congress. It's myself and our activism director, Rainey Reitman, delivering those signatures in the US Capitol. Uh, we have been interpreting what the meaning of both what the programs are and what the laws are for the public so they can understand uh, the bills. We've been looking at U.S. law. So there are two bills currently uh, that have prominence in the U.S. Congress trying to uh, address it. One is a fake fix from Senator Feinstein and Representative Rogers. It is designed to actually do nothing about the surveillance. Uh, sort of the answer to it being illegal is to pass laws to make it more legal. Um, and the other from Senator Leahy and Sensenbrenner, which is actually trying to rein in the NSA. Those bills are going forward, so watch, watch for them. And hopefully, through the Leahy and Sensenbrenner bill, we can get some improvements and get some uh, U.S. laws that will rein in the NSA. But there's more than just the U.S. laws. We're also pushing forward uh, 13 principles for uh, international spying. This is basically principles to be adopted by various countries' uh, legal systems on when it is appropriate to uh, conduct surveillance, making sure that it is only when it is necessary and only used in a manner that is proportionate. So please go check out necessaryandproportionate.net to read the principles. Uh, if you agree with them, you can sign. Uh, over 300 organizations have signed on to it, and these principles have become the basis for a UN resolution. There are also some legal processes that have uh, been going forward. The uh, Privacy International has submitted a claim to the European Convention on Human Rights, uh, and the Organization of American States has been holding a hearing. But in addition to uh, legal... Oh, Whoa. Sorry about that. There we go. 
um, in addition to the legal and policy efforts, there are things that we can do with technology, fighting their, their technology with better technology. Now, one of them here is HTTPS Everywhere. This is an EFF project uh, as a browser add-on that you can use to make sure that any site that can be HTTPS is HTTPS. Um, but there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. And hopefully some of the people in this room can work on these projects. And I think most importantly is to make these technologies easy to use. So there are technologies that provide end-to-end -end encryption for phones, for instant messaging and text, but they're not very easy to use. And to make them so basically that anybody can use these technologies, in fact that everybody is using these technologies, and then try and make sure that we're adding additional encryption to data at rest, to data in transit, uh, looking, well, and we found out actually, if you went to Jake's talk this morning, that we did a lot of works to secure things like our disk drives, our flash memory, our hardware. We need to shore up our crypto tools against sabotage, take a close look at all the standards that have been promulgated by NIST. It looks like that process has been compromised. and We need independent, open source tools that people can trust. So, and there is a lot that you can do. You can start, and I think a lot of you are already doing this, by paying attention. There's a lot going on, a lot of information, but absorb that information, look at it, share that information. You all probably know somebody who knows a little bit about this and should probably know more. Also, vote. Uh, make sure that your representatives know that this is very important to you. Uh, and they can put pressure on the U.S. government to try and rein in the spying. And this is actually, we've already seen some of this. Some of the governments, including uh, Germany, have been putting pressure on the U.S. to stop spying as much. And, well, hopefully uh, that the economic pressure is really what's going to do it. Uh, diplomatic pressure is nice and, and I think uh, needs to be done, but also uh, what we're seeing is a lot of economic pressure coming from other countries where it's affecting U.S. businesses, and that's something that Congress does listen to. Uh, another thing that's very important to you is use all of these tools. Um, we want it so that these encryption tools, safety tools, anonymization tools are used by everybody not just by people who, who the NSA is trying to target, but that we are all using encryption all of the time. Now, some forms of encryption are becoming quite commonplace, like uh, transport layer security, but end-to-end -end encryption is rare. So start using it, start using it more frequently, and get your friends to use it. And then finally, build the tools. Build the tools that are going to make a future that you would want to live in. We have a choice now of moving forward to a future which is going to be like a dystopian Philip K. Dick novel, or we can have a bright future, a future that has privacy, a future that has security. And you can build the tools to get to the future that you want. So, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. So uh, we have still a lot of time for questions. We're going to start with the internet. People in the room can line up behind one of the microphones and ask your question. Do we have a question from the IRC or Twitter? Speaking at ORCCON in June, John Perribola pledged that the EFF would do more to fight the r for the rights of non-Americans. The question coming for I for from the IRC now is, what, if anything, did the EFF following through on this promise? So, I'm sorry, to the, the question was fighting for the rights of non-Americans? Yes. Yes, indeed. So, we have been working on it, and I think probably most uh, prominently is the uh, necessary and proportionate uh, project, putting forth the uh, 13 principles uh, and organizing uh, the 300 organizations uh, to sign on to the principles, promulgating them to various countries around the world uh, and now also to the United Nations to get countries to uh, adopt these principles. Uh, also, um, we are trying to stop the programs through the court system uh, and if the, if the programs uh, stop, 
then this will affect both ends of the calls. Uh, and so we're hopeful that uh, uh, by finding that these things are unconstitutional, that this can put a significant rein on the program. Okay, microphone three, please. Yes, uh, hello, thanks for the great le lecture, I loved it. Um, one comment, when I read the name of the cell phone tracking program, FASCIA, um, some little history, when Benito Mussolini started his uh, fascist work in uh, Italy in the 1920s and 1930s, the name of their groups was FASCIA di Battimento. You can read it in Wikipedia. So perhaps they've chosen this name by accident, perhaps not, I don't know. Well, okay. Two short questions. Is there any evidence um, that they used uh, their knowledge of everybody, of everything, to, uh, to choose the politicians or managers they would like to have? Because when there is an upcoming politician who is perhaps against surveillance or against America, against anything, they could just link um, bad news to the media, for example, which porn he watches in the night in his room. First question. Second question, the Genie program. They spent $600 million in 2011 to insert <coughs> backdoors in hardware. Is there any evidence that they backdoored the BIOS or the firmware per default? In this case, you don't need to care about any encryption because you get all the um, key, um, keystrokes from the BIOS. Uh, okay, very good questions. On the first question, I have not seen evidence that the, the current program has been used to uh, undermine people except for the six people who, who were uh, not identified but mentioned in a, uh, uh, basically the radicalizers that we were talking before. Uh, but the slides did not identify who those radicalizers were. Um, on the question of have they undermined it, there is an unfortunate history Uh, if we look back at uh, J. Edgar Hoover, who was the director of the American Federal Bureau of Investigation for uh, decades, uh, he actually did uh, uh, get information about some of the more embarrassing materials about uh, people he needed to work with uh, and is alleged to have used that information to uh, obtain you know, favorable budgets for the FBI and things that he was wanted. So, There is an unfortunate and dangerous history of that happening, but we haven't seen uh, direct evidence that it has happened right now. Uh, and on your second question about uh, worrying about uh, uh, going on uh, attacks on BIOS, um, I don't know if you saw uh, Jake's talk from earlier today, but it was revealing a lot of stuff about their uh, misuse of BIOS and attacks on hardware. So I would suggest you take a look at uh, that talk and the slides that were revealed in uh, today's Der Spiegel. Thank you. Thank you. So, question from the internet again. One question coming from IOC um, was, how could an individual detect or help to detect censorship if any, if of any form, for instance, on broadband connection? Uh, so, how can you detect censorship? Um, well, It's an interesting question. So I guess if I'm interpreting this question correctly, it's that how would you know if you are uh, going across a broadband that what you are uh, obtaining is what you expected to obtain? And we can see from the quantum insert that they can modify what you are receiving when you go out uh, into uh, the, the web uh, and give you back something which is different from what uh, was originally planned to be uh, given to you. And I guess the way to, to do that is from checking things through alternate channels. Uh, if, if what you're receiving is something different from what somebody else is receiving, then that may suggest that one of these things has been modified. Uh, so um, it's a way of detecting it. It's my understanding that for most of this, when they are, are injecting packets and giving things which are different from what you're intending, it's designed to be sneaky. It's designed to not be detectable, and if you're changing Uh, what is being transmitted, then that is somewhat detectable. Though there's another form of censorship that is going on and is very unfortunate, which is the self-censorship of intimidation that happens when you know that your communications may be monitored and then you may not go and get the information that you need. And this is why it's very important to use tools, tools like the Tor browser, uh, use encryption technologies so that you can go and get the information you need with more confidence. Okay. Thank you.
Then number four, please. Yes, um, I was um, interested about the programs that they have, like uh, HTTPS everywhere and stuff, so that um, maybe one day we'll have to, uh, encryption by default. But I was also thinking maybe, maybe one day. wouldn't it be possible uh, to just spam the NSA by, by having a daemon uh, service running on my computer that's sending out emails with the buzzwords in there and encrypting uh, nonsense and sending it over so the NSA will save it because it's encrypted. Are you working on such a program? Because I think in the beginning the people who are using it will be exposed and so it would be good to have an organization who is, who is running this uh, at one point of a time so that many users join at the same time and not no one is, is, is really exposed to the NSA as an individual. So I've seen a number of proposals along these lines, trying to basically you know, overload the, uh, the channels with uh, the type of information you might expect that they are uh, looking for. I mean, one thing I'll note, if you saw the size of the Utah facility, they have a tremendous capability uh, of storing data. They have a tremendous capability of, of processing data. So it would take an incredible uh, attack to have any sort of meaningful denial of service. So what we've really been focusing on is trying to do the first thing we're talking about is get HTTPS by default all over the place all of the time. One thing is the project like HTTPS Everywhere turning something which is uh, optional HTTPS and making it by default through the add-on. And the other is putting the pressure on companies to make it the default. Uh, and as you go check out uh, the Encrypt the Web report that I mentioned earlier, and you can see a lot of check marks in the by default. And actually, a number of those were changed within the last couple of months. Were changed in reaction to what's going on. So I think sort of the better use of resources is try and get as much encryption all the time, all over the place. Microphone two. Okay. Yeah, I, I got two questions. The one thing is um, about uh, economic pressure. Um, so um, just to clarify, um, what you're saying is um, that um, in reality, one should for example, exclude Windows products from all international um, uh, acquisitions um, with, on information critical systems, as you should do anyway, but um, so that they will not be able to sell it um, as an example for economic pressure. And the second one, um, how about um, legal pressure, um, criminal legal pressure for individuals that clearly um, work outside the scope of the law? Um, for example, um, would it, should we all, shouldn't we all perhaps file criminal, um, uh, uh, criminal accusations in our national legislations and see if those anti-terror laws work in our favor for once? Um, yeah. As an activist <laughs> proposal. <laughs> Uh, so uh, let, me, let me address these. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, on the first one, economic pressure. And I think actually this is, this is the most effective. Uh, it, it is, it's something that we know that the U.S. government does listen to. It is concerned about the economics of it, the U.S. companies. Uh, and one of the things that actually was uh, extraordinary is uh, we had a number of U.S. companies, uh, eight internet companies, they, they signed a, uh, a statement asking the government to stop the spying, and I think in part because it was affecting their interests. And the sabotage program that the NSA has been doing is sabotaging these companies' ability to sell things around the world because they tread, we have these products, they are secure, and then it turns out, in fact, they're not secure. They are backdoored. They have these problems. Uh, and that would be a reason why someone might not want to use these things. Um, that will have, I think, a potent effect. Um, Going after people criminally, I mean, this, is, this has been tried. Uh, there have been complaints that have been raised uh, against members of the Bush administration stemming from both uh, some of the earlier allegations or you know, earlier revelations about spying and also about some things uh, having to do with like the Iraq war and so on. Uh, this hasn't had a substantial effect on, on policy so far. Thank you. Okay, thank you. One more question from the internet, please. What do you actually think about, I think of efforts like GNU-NET to solve the fundamental problem of unequipped by default internet traffic? So the question is, what do I think about, sorry, say that again? What do you think about um, efforts like GNU-NET to solve the fundamental problem of unencrypted by default internet traffic? So I'm not familiar with GNU-NET. Um, I do think that uh, on the whole, we want to have it be the standard that all internet traffic should be encrypted. 
right? The, the internet was built in a time when it didn't seem that encryption was a, a you know, necessary feature, it was an additional feature, but it should become a default feature and we should try to change the standards to include encryption as a basic feature of communications. Okay, then one last question from microphone three, please. Hi. Um, so you mentioned a bunch of um, very nice examples where legal terms are reinterpreted in ways that um, don't make very much sense. Like, for example, when you said they acquire data without using the word of acquisition and stuff. Yes. Um, so my question is, um, why do they even come up with these uh, pseudo-legal escapes that every reasonable person would think are um, illegal? Is it just that they have an excuse once things become public, which they weren't supposed anyway? So why did they prepare for the excuse? So, so what is all this legal framework for? So, for example, my expectation would be that the NSA or uh, the agencies in general just do the stuff they want to do. And um, of course, then the next question is, if there is more stuff outside that framework that's not pseudo-legally um, allowed and still done? Well, so it's a good question. And so why, why play the word games? Um, there's a couple of reasons to play, play the word games. One is internal and the other is external. And I'll look at two of them that we talked about. One was uh, acquisition without acquiring, and the other was sort of collection without collecting. Um, and I'll start with the collection without collecting. This was used externally so that when they testified before Congress, they could say things like, we're not collecting this, we're not collecting that, when in their heads they were secretly meaning by collecting you know, this crazy definition, and then the, the senator or representative who was asking the question was thinking that they were meaning collection in the ordinary sense, and so really they weren't doing this, this thing that they were in fact doing, and so that later, when it came about, they could not be brought up you know, saying they lied to Congress. Um, and so there was, you know, there was one incident with uh, the Director of National Intelligence, uh, Clapper, where he kind of got into a, a, a bad way where one of the senators uh, asked him a very direct que question um, about uh, getting the uh, information on phone calls and he said he denied it and then it turned out that that was happening. But by and large, they're using these word games in order to be responsive but without giving the information that is really being sought. Uh, but then you have the uh, acquisition without acquiring. Now, this was done in secret. This was part of a secret memo that was only reviewed by a very small group of people. Uh, and the reason, I think, for, for that is because, believe it or not, there are still some good people out there, even within the government, people who need to see an explanation as to why this is legal. Even if they are not morally opposed to, to the surveillance, they do believe in the rule of law, and those people need to have this sort of explanation. Uh, and they tried to do this in two ways, by coming up with the, well, BS explanation, and then keeping it secret and telling, well, don't worry, you're a pretty little head about it, we have this secret explanation that's all good. Uh, and then one thing that, that is useful about that is that uh, uh, hopefully some of these people the ones that are good, who do care about the rule of law, are now starting to see alternate views about what these, uh, these are, uh, alternate views about the legal analysis. It might be saying that, hey, what we were doing was wrong. What we were doing was beyond the law. And then remember that the oath that they took was an oath to the Constitution, was an oath that respects free expression and respects privacy. Okay, thank you very much for your talk. Thank you, everybody.